sort our recording as well. So we have a few people in the waiting room, so we'll just let everybody in here. How is everybody? Doing good. How's everybody there? Good. Thank you. We were just talking about Cleveland Market, West End Market, and I was saying that West End Market was one of those places that was really like formative for me as a as someone who loves food. Um, I hadn't seen maybe that quantity of food ever in my life when I went to the market for the first time as like a you know 18 year old. Um, ethnic foods, butchers, bakers, produce, just the abundance, cheese, everything. It was like this European model that I didn't I didn't see growing up in Arkansas. Um, yeah. Our poor farmers market. So we live just outside of the city. We're in the suburbs. And our when I moved, I'm a city girl. I grew up in the city. I'm just outside of Chicago. And when I moved to the suburbs and went to the farmers market, I'm very used to like the city and like all, you know all of that. And it's so very different. And then when I moved to the suburbs, I went to our farmers market. It is all crafters. Like <laughs> Like if you need a Bears flag, a Chicago Bears flag, like that's where you go. Is I'm like, what is this farmers uh, market? <laughs> this is not right. <laughs> so you're saying you're saying it's all textiles? Yeah, it's just it's very like like knickknacks. Yeah, pretty arts much arts and crafts. Like, arts and crafts, exactly. <laughs> if Everything you need, made with you know, popsicle sticks and cotton right. balls. <laughs> right. You know, Chicago Bears flip flops or Blackhawks. You know, <laughs> baseball caps with fuzzies on it. That's our farmer's market. <laughs> it's not There's, the same. <laughs> yeah, that, that ought to be a crafter's market or something. I don't right, know. Right, exactly. So you exactly. can't buy a loaf of like, uh, can't buy a loaf of anything. Not really. <laughs> You've got a business opportunity, it looks like. Right, you're not kidding there. That is so true. <laughs> We're just letting in a few more people here. We have a few minutes if everybody wants to hop on and say, you know, who you are and where you're from. That would be great just to introduce ourselves. Marissa, do you want to start? You're at the top yeah, I'll left get started. of my screen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Marissa Vili. Um, I'm the certification coordinator at RBA. So if you have any questions about uh, certifying with RBA, becoming a certified master baker, um, or either even a certified decorator, certified journey baker. Um, I manage um, all of that and the applications and the part of the educational side of that as well. Um, I am based out of outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and I have a background in in baking. Um, so that's me. I don't know who's next. <laughs> we'll go right to our our next King Arthur background there. That was well done. <laughs> I think you're on mute there, but. <laughs> Fix that. Okay, here we go. I'm there we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Yankalo. I work with Martin and King Arthur on the other side of the country, though. I work in the West for King Arthur on the bakery flower side. And I am coming to you from San Diego. Jeff, you need to say a little bit more than that, dude. So let me. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. Let me do this. <laughs> Jeff Yankalo um, is not only a great baker but he's also got a background in culinary work for charlie trotter he was on the u.s coupe de monde team that won gold the only team to have ever won gold i think right two, two of us two teams yeah. yeah okay two teams won gold jeff won it uh most recently with the team in 2012 oh, yeah. Yeah. dang Silver okay. in 2012. Yeah. yeah and then came back to coach in 2012 right yeah um former president of the bread bakers guild of america chairman i guess um, and a great baker. What I said about Jeff, and I tell everybody about Jeff, is that if Jeff says to do something, it's right. So <laughs> if he tells you to like do that. something today, just know that it's right. Yeah, I'm gonna. If Martin needs some, any, any, t any, like, uh, if there are any questions on flour, on like uh, district, whatever, how flour gets around the country, things like that, I'm gonna help him out. So. And also some of the testing. And Jeff also worked with DDA for a long time, so I feel like. Um, where I got a lot of my mentorship was from Jeffrey Hamelman, and I feel like Jeff, is it accurate to say that you were like mentored quite a bit by DDA? Yeah. Yep. 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 
it's great to have people like that that all of us can sort of grow from and through and like i feel like part of the part of the burden now or the honor i guess is that we can um try and mentor others through our own relationship with baking and with bakers so um i'm glad to have jeff here and i'm sure you guys are too all right thank, thank you. you for joining us Roy, we'll go to you. You're next in the middle of my screen here. So am I on the, uh, am I the to, to block somebody in Hollywood Squares? Right. <laughs> was, that's how it looks on my screen. X gets the uh, square. <laughs> by the way, I'm using an older camera. It's got a lower resolution, so it seems to break up a bit. Uh, my name is Roy Kalen. I'm an amateur baker. I have a certificate in artisan uh, breads, working on a pastry certificate. Uh, I do this because I enjoy it. I'm not an, I'm not an owner, at least not yet. And I, but I work uh, full time at National Lewis University, which last year acquired Kendall College. I'm not in their baking or culinary, but uh, it's uh, it's nice to be able to be in, in the proximity. And I'm just trying to learn. I just want to know uh, the points of view out there, and uh, always try and pick up the tips uh, and processes and successes that others have tried. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Great. Scott? Hello. Yeah. Hi, Scott. <laughs> slow on the, on the mouse there. Um, I'm Scott Calvert. I'm in uh, Austin, Texas. And I've got a bakery out here. I just passed uh, 24 years of having a bakery out here. So I'm still trying to figure things out <laughs> daily. <laughs> But uh, it's actually kind of cool to be on here. My first introduction to uh, King Arthur is I was a nephew student way back, <laughs> way back 30 plus years ago. And uh, so that was my introduction to the flower because that's what we used at school. And um, anyway, it's been cool to see how much that's grown. And, and when I go to shows around the country, seeing uh, King Arthur set up and sampling the products that y'all have. And, you know, I always think it's an amazing product. So. Um, I guess uh, Bernadette, well, um, I'm the vice president of the RBA, so I got connected with that several years back, and it's been a lot of fun, and uh, look forward to seeing what else we do on there. And, and Roy, if you ever want to talk about becoming an owner, just call me. <laughs> <laughs> If you ever want to get serious about that. People, people <laughs> warn me, oh, you should do this. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, do I really want to? I, I, I'll give, I may give you a call. Thank you. Hey, Austin's a great place to live. You got to come down, Roy. <laughs> What's the old joke? Isn't there an old joke? It's like, how do you make a small fortune in a bakery? You start with a big one. <laughs> right. Very good. Lynn, your next square. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lynn Sherman. I'm the education director for RBA and also the owner of Cold Spring Bakery in Cold Spring, Minnesota. We're um, retail, 45% uh, retail, 55% wholesale. We've got five trucks. Uh, we focus on selling to grocery stores, so we make quite a bit of bread and buns and, of course, and a lot of donuts, cakes, and whole line of products. And um, I'm anxious to hear what's going to be shared today. Thank you, Lynn. Patty, we have you next. There we Hi. go. Hi. So Martin is actually from Arkansas like I am. So there we go. Whoa. Where are you from, Patty? Conway. No kidding. Yeah, I, uh, I, met, I met you at, I know, we, along with everybody else, but I did one of your classes at Ivy and it was, uh, it was great. Oh, great. In fact, I, we, I, I sent you an email recently wanting that rosemary croissant okay. formula okay. that was at that was at Ivy. Those things were so good. But, that was um, really good, right? Yeah, they were really good. Um, so my name is Patty Stobaum in Conway, Arkansas. I've been in the bakery business for 14 years. Uh, my husband is in the restaurant business and for 40 years, well, the <laughs> restaurant that we have is 40 years old. The oldest one is 40. The other one's 36, but um, started out baking as a second career for me. I was a corporate accountant for 25 years and just sick of the corporate world. Um, and here I am 
still trying to figure out what I'm doing, but it's fun. We have um, we have two bakeries now. Uh, one of them is a is our newest addition, and and it's uh, fully scratch European type pastries. Um, we use King Arthur flour, yay, and um, just having a lot of fun with it. And I'm the current president of the RBA. This is my first year of the two year term. Thank Congratulations, you. Patty. Wasn't um, wasn't Rick from Fayetteville? Wasn't he president for, president for a long time? Yeah, a long time ago he was. Yeah, yeah. Yep. gosh, it's been probably what fifteen years or so ago. Okay, but Rick Boone, yes. Yep. Rick's Donuts, man. Yes, <laughs> I can still remember. I can still remember them, and I, you know, nobody makes them like his used to. They were so good. They were. They are. Um, he opened the same year that my husband opened Stobie's, and so we um, forty years. Yeah, long time. I'm going to mute myself. I have six dogs and I happen to be <laughs> at home. I do foster, so I'm not that crazy. I only have five, but you know, anyhow. Thank you, Patty. Um, we'll head down to Ted. If you want to introduce yourself, unmute yourself and then introduce yourself. Let's see if Ted, Ted can, if you can hear us, you can unmute your line and you can introduce yourself. If not, we'll move over to Karen. We will move over to Karen. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Karen. I'm, I'm assuming you mean Karen Krimmer. I don't know yeah. if there's another Karen there. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. How are you today? Good. Good, thank you. Good. Um, I am a professor uh, of baking and pastry arts at Columbus State Community College in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I'm formerly from Cleveland, so uh, Martin, when you made a reference to the West Side Market earlier, I, uh, that, that's my stomp and ground, so I appreciate <laughs> that com comment. Um, I um, developed the Baking and Pastry Arts program at Columbus State. Uh, I started in 2006, and we moved from a baking certificate program uh, to a uh, Baking and Pastry Arts program major. Uh, so I'm very proud of that. We're accredited by the American Culinary Federation. And um, what else? So I've been teaching baking and pastry arts uh, since 2006, but I am a lifelong baker. And I just wanted to say that I have successfully uh, made the specification for King Arthur flour products at our brand new uh, blend bakery and cafe and restaurant operations known as Degrees at Mitchell Hall at Columbus State Community College. So I'm very fond of King Arthur products. Awesome. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you, Karen. Thank you. We'll head down to Joel. If you can unmute your line, Joel, and introduce yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted, I think. Can you you are. <laughs> All right, another one from Cleveland, guys. It seems like there's a lot of <laughs> Cleveland going on. <laughs> Well, we've, uh, Davis Bakery has been around this year. We're celebrating our 81st anniversary. Wow. So we've been around. My father, my father and his brother started the company 80 year, 81 years ago. Uh, I'm the last of the second generation, and I'm fortunate. My two sons, both college grads, have decided to get into this crazy business. So they have both been with me uh, actually 12, 13, or 13 and 14 years already. So uh, we are a full line bakery. We do retails about 50% of our business and institutional business is another 50% of our business. So with the COVID, we've been very fortunate. Our, uh, we have two retail stores. Our retail stores have been doing fine. Our institutional business, we dropped about 80% with our hotels, casinos, everybody being closed. So we, we took a big hit there, but it is slowly uh, starting to come back. So that's what's happening here in Cleveland at Davis Bakery. Joel, I love Davis Bakery. I especially love your Russian tea biscuits and <laughs> coconut bars. They're the best. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the uh, number one item on our website <laughs> that, we, that we ship all over the country are our coconut bars. And probably most of you don't know what a coconut bar is, right? Uh, a coconut bar is we take our white cake and chocolate cake and we make a special chocolate sauce. We hand dip them and then they're enrobed in desiccated macaroon coconut. And they're uh, the best. Everybody yeah. should try them. Yeah. Say, Joel, Thank you. If, Joel, if I may, uh, I used to live in Cleveland 
uh, and work there. And I'm just curious, I didn't make it to your bakery, but I'm kind of curious as to what, uh, which side of the Cuyahoga were, are you on? I'm trying to check you out on, online here. Okay, uh, well, in our, in our prime, we actually had 39 retail stores all in Cleveland, 450, 450 employees. So uh, that was the good side. The bad side, we had five labor unions. <laughs> So uh, the labor unions uh, almost put us out of business. So we ended up downsizing our operation. As I said earlier, we're down to two retail stores. And we decided to focus more on our institutional business. So we were able to go to, from five unions down to one union. I think my hair is starting to grow back. I sleep much better at night. And uh, so we are down to two, but we were all over Cleveland. We had stores all over not only freestanding, but we also had stores inside uh, stores. We actually ran, and we're also not only bakery, we're, we've been in the deli business also since 1952. And uh, we found there's a good retail affinity with uh, the deli and bakery. And uh, we ran the bakery deli department in the Sears stores. We purchased that in the early 70s. And we were inside many discount stores, uh, most were regional. I'm not sure they'd be familiar with you. Also in drug stores. So when we had 39 stores, they weren't all freestanding stores. Many of them were just leased apartments where we had maybe three or four bakery cases and uh, we're running cold spots. All of our stores had, when we, even when we had our 39, had ovens and we did baking in each store. We had a central plant. We would send either half-baked or raw product out to all of our locations. The premise my dad and his brothers had was always have hot, fresh product coming out of the ovens. Very good. Thank you, Joel. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We will move to Mark. Mark Heyman, if you can unmute your line and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Heyman. I'm the Associate Dean for Baking and Pastry at the CIA. Um, we have a wide variety of folks here, um, which is pretty cool. I, I enjoy that tremendously. Um, I am with the RBA, work with their certification uh, arm of the RBA. Um, been doing this since um, 81. Uh, should you go into business, Roy? Hell yes, the best thing possible. Uh, you will make no money, but it's the best thing you can possibly do. Uh, there's more to life than money. There's much more to life than money. Um, but I've owned bakeries, uh, did wholesale for a while. I was teaching, uh, but currently right now I'm the associate dean at the CIA up in Hyde Park. And that's about it. Thank you, Mark. Is, uh, is Chef Coppage around there? Yes, he's teaching. Uh, go figure. He's um, substituting for Peter Grueling. He's trying, to, uh, Chef Coppage is trying to teach a chocolate class this evening. <laughs> he, he's having to go at it, so. Give him our best. Mark, don't crush Roy's spirit so fast, okay? <laughs> Keep him into it. It's, it's, it's the best thing. Honestly, uh, Scott, you'll, you can attest to it. It's the best thing in the world, honestly. Uh, I love it. They're, hey, they're 30, just, 30 years in, I still love coming to work every day. There you go. There you go. Got to start. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Marlene, last but certainly not least, Miss Marlene. Can we hear you? Are you unmuted? I can also do Marlene's introduction because I know Marlene very well. <laughs> Marlene is our wonderful, fantastic membership director for the RBA and she's been with us for a few years now. And if you have any questions about membership or any sort of thing that has to do with that, uh, Marlene is your go-to for sure. So we appreciate having Marlene and, and Marissa and everyone else that's on, on the call, uh, Lynn as well on the call too. So that's our staff. So now we will get started, Martin. It is all you. I'm gonna do a brief introduction if that's okay. Um, so Martin Phillip, which I'm sure most are um, very familiar with, he's a baker and an author. His book, Breaking Bread, A Baker's Journey Home in 75 Recipes, was recently awarded the 2018 Vermont Book Award. 
the best cookbook of 2018 by the New York Book Industry Guild and grand prize at the New England Book Festival, a native of Arkansas. He is sought after for his education, which is why we are so grateful for him to be on our call today. And he has traveled internationally to share his love of baking and the craft. So welcome, 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 Martin. And I am gonna pass it all to you right now. Thank you, Martin. Awesome. Thank you, Bernadette. And thanks everybody for taking some time out of um, Monday afternoon to just mostly just talk baking. Um, the introductions are really, really helpful actually because it sort of frames like um, who I'm talking to and I'm not sure that it like aspects of this um, presentation we can just blow through because I don't feel like anybody necessarily needs to know the difference between pastry and all purpose. Um, we can talk about it some though. Um, so uh, I guess, and before I get to that, I guess I should just say thanks. Um, thanks to the RBA for having us. Um, it's, it's tough these days, you know, we've got to find um, where our community is and where the points are where we can come together. So uh, it's nice to have, um, to have this. I guess I need to, sh to uh, take over the screen, Donna. That's what I need to do, huh? Let's see I here. made you the host, so hopefully that works. <laughs> okay, let me see here. Your screen, is that right? Yeah. Uh, is it this one? Let's do that. That's not the one. Let me see here. There we go. Can you guys see Flower 101? Is that what it shows? Is it full screen or do you just see a portion of it? Full screen. Full screen, awesome, okay, great. Yeah, um, yeah. Flower 101. Um, and like I said, let me just emphasize, like please interrupt, please you know, just call out. You don't have to raise a hand or anything like that. Let's make this conversational. Um, I think it'll be richer that way. Um, so, uh thank you let's go to the next thing here so i'll talk just briefly about king arthur i think people know who we are um i think what people don't always realize is that in addition to being a company that's really committed to um, quality and consistency um, committed to being a resource for bakers um, committed to you know providing hardware small wares for bakers um, content and everything else we're also um, to a large degree, a mission-driven company. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about agriculture, milling, wheat, flour, and then really the part of the conversation where I feel like we should definitely leave some time for is like, what's next? Um, so let's get started here. Everybody see the graphic? You may have noticed we just, um, changed the name of our company and rebranded a little bit. We're now the King Arthur Baking Company. We're not King Arthur Flour anymore. We felt like we needed to speak to our role as something bigger than just a, a seller of flour or um, whether that's retail or wholesale. And so we've rebranded and you may have seen the new logo and there's all kinds of stuff to go with that now. A um, little bit of company history. We're founded in 1790. Um, there are definitely older companies in America, but there aren't that many. You could probably count them on about maybe two hands plus some toes. Um, founded in 1790, originally we were um, only importing flour because we needed to. And then over time we became, uh, you know, we're, um, you know, contracting with millers and distributing flour and doing all that stuff. Um, we're employee owned. And um, that's something that you see more and more of now, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it was hard to find an employee owned company, but I think these days it's more and more common to see that. Um, and sometimes when people ask like, well, what does that mean? Usually what I say is that means that every job is my job as an employee. <laughs> so if I'm walking across the parking lot and I see a cigarette butt on the ground, um, I pick it up, it's part of my job. And I like that. And I think that that ethos, sort of works and I think that um, those of you who own your own um, bakeries or um, restaurants uh, or delis um, you get that in the sense that 
It's like you walk into work and, and you have a level of ownership, which is different than if you feel like you're just sort of lining someone else's pockets. Um, and I think that really, it makes for a special work environment to me. It means that I care in a different and deeper way. Um, and so I'm a fan of it. Um, we're also a, a B corporation or a benefit corporation. And what that means is that we're evaluated every other year um, through a very extensive, difficult audit. And they look at three areas. They look for what we do for our employees. They look for what we do for our community. And they also look for what we do to lessen our impact on the environment. And um, every year we get, every other year we get a score and then it has to improve. Um, and so uh, I think it's an important aspect of like who we are as a company. Uh, we're members of 1% for the Planet, the non-GMO project. Uh, we do a lot of work around whole grains. We do a lot of work around um, teaching kids how to bake through our Bake for Good program. Um, we're a very mission-driven company. Um, and when I first came to King Arthur, I was coming from uh, a different career. I was working in investment banking in New York City. And... Um, the culture there was one of the reasons that I left and the culture at King Arthur was one of the reasons that I'm still here today is because of this, this stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, we have a lot of sort of inspirational statements or logos or um, ways of expressing who we are. Um, the one that I really like and I kind of hang on to is inspire, educate, and bake. Um, I come back to that a lot because I think it's sort of clarifying. Um, we want to produce content that's inspiring. Um, we want to produce content which is educational and we want to bake. And so we want to have great, high quality, consistent ingredients. Uh, and the other thing we say a lot as a tagline is that we are bakers. And really throughout the company, you find people who love to bake. And that is not necessarily just people who are in production baking roles, people who are stocking the shelves in the store, people who are working in the warehouse or selling flour. Um, Lots of bakers kicking around. We produce a lot of content, uh, whether it's thousands of recipes, whether it's um, social media, Instagram, Twitter, all of that stuff. Uh, we put a lot of content out there. We have baking schools on both coasts. We have one in Norwich, Vermont. Um, and, you know, in non-COVID times, we're teaching classes like literally about 350 days a year or something like that. I mean, we are there almost every day. That's not a holiday teaching and it's, you know, kids classes, home baker classes, professional classes, like top to bottom. Um, and we have a school on the West Coast as well uh, near Bellingham, Washington, which is where the Bread Lab is, which is some of you may know about. And in Norwich, we have an award-winning bakery as well. Any questions so far? Everybody good? Okay. So um, what I wanted to do was sort of start um, in the beginning a little bit. And <laughs> that sounds like, sounds like we're gonna be here for a week or not. Um, so, uh, it's interesting to me, there's some research that came out this year, um, and I guess more in recent years, and I wanna talk about that a little bit in terms of the history of baking or the origins of baking. Um, but before we get to that, I wanna sort of frame where things began. So, um, agriculture. Agriculture is the deliberate modification of Earth's surface through cultivation of plants and rearing of animals to obtain sustenance or economic grain. Where we think, where scientists think that agriculture kind of began is in the Fertile Crescent. And the Fertile Crescent is this green band. It's Mesopotamia, basically. And it's between two rivers. There are two rivers that sort of run on the sort of north and, you know, northeast, southwest side of this green band. It's the Euphrates and the Tigris. And in that valley, which flooded or floods on a regular basis, the soil was really good. And about 10,000 BC, we began to see the sort of beginnings of what looks like agriculture. And it's agriculture which was intentional, which is different than foraging, right? Foraging is the gathering of um, grains that'll, that are wildly available. And so, we can link a lot of that early development to this society, the Sumerians, um, who did a lot of pretty impressive stuff 
uh, from metallurgy to inventing the plow, the chariot. Um, so this is where, you know, this is the Fertile Crescent, basically. Something that's come out recently, and I found this to be fascinating, and maybe it's because I'm a little daft, but I found it fascinating that baking precedes agriculture. And maybe that's because I'm a baker, right? Uh, if you want to bake something, um, you mill some grain or you um, open a bag of flour, right? But what they've figured out is that um, they've found evidence of baking in Jordan, which precedes agriculture by thousands of years. And so um, what they found at this site, and this is a picture of the actual site in Jordan, 14,400 BC, they found some archeological remains and they were able to treat what was basically um, some bread that was left in the oven. Uh, they were able to treat it a certain way and then look at it under an electron microscope and determine exactly um, what it was and what the primary grains were which were used to produce it. And what they found was that it was like a flatbread, basically. Um, and it was made with barley, iron, corn, and oats. And also had evidence of other, um, other things in it something that's kind of like in the category of like a cattail, if you know what a cattail, like a cattail marsh, basically. What they were doing was um, they would peel the roots and then smash them and add them in with other stuff. So this is like the first pizza party. Um, there's also evidence of some brewing, which is kind of interesting. Um, so this culture, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's the Natufian culture. and they began to do some grinding and they used this sort of tool and these implements. Um, this is an actual, this flat one in the lower image is an actual, um, an actual thing that was used for grinding those grains. I think that's kind of amazing. I don't know. Um, one of the things my grandfather gave me was a collection of his arrowheads that he had collected over a long period of time. And, for me, holding those artifacts is, is super cool. And as a baker, it's sort of double cool to see things that were used to um, process grain and other things. So we're kind of looking at where milling began, right? Um, this image in the upper left is something that uh, was dated to around 30,000 BC and that was used to grind sedges, grasses, and as, as I mentioned, cattails. You think about it, um, nothing came in a bag. Everything came in a package, right? Everything that you're going to eat had to be processed um, to a large degree. And so this is one of the earliest examples that they have of how people were processing um, grains and other things so that they could be eaten. What's incredible to me is um, how quickly this technology um, moved throughout the world. You know, in a matter of only, you know, thousands of years, which seems, I don't know, in, you know, in evolutionary years, it seems pretty quick to me that only a few thousand years later, you had a saddle cairn. That one that's below the upper left is called a saddle cairn. And this style, can be found in cultures in absolutely every country, every corner of the world, this exact technology. That one's from Norway. You see it throughout the British Isles. Um, you see it in Central and South America. You see it in Asia. Pretty amazing. And what they can do, what scientists have been able to do is actually process these stones by drilling a small, small, small chip uh, and then they're able to look and see exactly what these were used to grind. So the next evolutionary step, and I feel like it's kind of the one that we would recognize the most, is this rotary cairn, 1000 BC, and it's it's worldwide, absolutely worldwide. The um, you can kind of figure out how it is. I mean, if you think forward to the stone mill, you've got the runner. And then you've got the bedstone, basically, right? And then you've got a rotating, usually a stick in the middle. 
and this rotates and, uh, sorry, the stick on the side, and it rotates and then you drop your grain in the center hole. It's one of those things that just hasn't changed that much. The basic um, engineering of it is really largely the same with modern stone milling. So this is sort of the next evolutionary step. You still got the runner and often driven by animals, but I bet just as often pushed by um, humans. Uh, these were not people who were belonging to any unions, that's for sure, unfortunately. Um, the image on the right is uh, a wholesale bakery from Pompeii in Italy, been covered by um, the volcano blast. Um, they know this was a wholesale bakery. It had no retail storefront. They can look at the archaeology of it and know that this was a place that was producing bread for sale in other locations. So, I don't know. These are kind of amazing. They have found, from this same site in Pompeii, they have found, um, they have excavated, excavated actual loaves. If anybody has seen those, um, they're pretty amazing. So stone milling. Um, so let's talk about milling a little bit. Um, in the US in the 1890s, there were 22,000 mills, over 22,000 mills in Vermont alone, which was not, which is not a big state and, you know, remains very rural, had very low, um, you know, populations really in the 19th century. And we know that there were 200 stone mills in Vermont alone. 200 stone mills in Vermont alone. Um, so, you know, back in the day, everybody was doing their own um, stone and local milling, kind of amazing. Um, today, you know, steel roller mills, uh, we know that they produce white flour. Um, there are about 200 nationally owned by about five companies. Um, but regional grain economies are coming back. Um, in my role at King Arthur, I do some work with Northern Grain Growers Association, and um, we're funding test plots. Uh, and there's some farmers in the Northeast Kingdom here that I work with pretty closely, and we're looking at varieties that grow well in our, um, I would say, difficult environment um, up here where we don't have a long season. We have wet springs and wet falls often. Um, but it's exciting for us to see that, and that may sound strange coming from a company that's looking, you know, if we're gonna sell flour, we need it to be nationally available. We need volume, we need consistency. Um, we have a lot of things that we want um, regionally sourced or grown flour to do, so we're not there yet, but I would say that we're putting energy into ways which we can, to a greater degree, connect um, people with the food that they eat. Um, so, Definitely, we're seeing some rebirth of regional growing and milling. Um, and, you know, that's manifesting in baking, um, but also in brewing and distilling. Um, you know, there are some breweries in Vermont that are trying to do a lot with um, local malt and also distillers that are not only um, distilling with local grain, but they're also, there's actually in our town here, there's a distillery that's making vodka with maple syrup. So, good stuff. Late 19th century, about 90% of homes baked their own bread. 40, 50 years later, about 90% was store-bought. Um, it's good for us, you know, it's good for people who are making bread for a living. And um, we're a company that also wants to see people, um, we feel like people who are baking good bread at home, it sort of raises the tide for everybody. The more people know what good quality bread is, um, the more they support businesses such as ours and those who belong to the RBA and BBGA and other places which value um, quality baked goods. So stone milling in the modern era, um, you know, this is kind of a small image, but hopefully you can see it. It's not that different than the rotary cairn or the um, stone mill that you saw from the image in Pompeii. Uh, it's water powered. Um, I lived in Italy for a little while, and one once we went to eat at a mill that had been converted into a restaurant, but the mill still worked. And uh, after the meal, um, the guy 
knew that I was interested in baking. Um, and I was just a hobbyist at that point, but he took us down to the basement and you could hear the water just roaring underneath this mill. And um, he opened the sluice gate for us and you could just watch the water flying through the underneath part of this mill. It's an incredible, uh, incredible to see. And one of my oldest memories for the, uh, for Patty, Patty, you may have been to Johnson, Arkansas. Um, one of my oldest memories is going to the Johnson mill to buy flour with my mother um, right off the stones. And I think that, you know, it's one of those like experiences that sort of points you in the direction of where you might end up. But I remember doing that at like five or six years old. Um, cross section of the millstone. Um, if anybody is looking at um, sort of in-store milling or um, if you're thinking about purchasing a mill yourself, um, we got one at King Arthur um, because I wanted a way to grind whatever I wanted for use in the bakery. And so we got ourselves an Oski roller and it basically looks exactly the same at the, as this one, which has a cutaway. And then on the right hand side, um, that's actually from the inside of Farmer Direct. Um, Farmer Direct is a farming cooperative and mill in um, Kansas, which mills all of our whitehole wheat. And um, they are stone milling entirely. The mills there actually set up on the vertical axis as opposed to this horizontal axis of the one with a cutaway. Um, but if you have a chance to go visit a mill, I encourage you to do so. It's, it's a, it wasn't the first thing that I did as a baker, but I knew it was one of the first things that I wanted to do. Uh, it took me a little while to get there, but I, I love sort of reaching uphill to those connections, whether it's to the mill or to the farmer. Um, it's one of the great reasons that we're involved with Farmer Direct is that it gives us this direct line which proves that flour is not just a commodity like sugar or salt or something else. It's a thing that's created from a living seed and it's variable, you know, annually. Um, that to me is something that's like special about it and it's one of the reasons that I'm a baker. It's not the same every year. I like that. Roller milling. Um, so I think that I don't need to spend a ton of time on this. I think that most of us who are working with uh, white flour know what roller mills are. They we know how efficient they are. Um, the technology, you know, mid 19th century, there's some debate about like who, who did it first. Um, but it essentially is, you know, this process of reducing breaks and sieving which produces um, white flour largely pulled from the endosperm of the grain. Anybody has any questions at any point, like don't hesitate to just say, hey, shut it for a minute, let me ask my question. <laughs> okay, um, hammer milling is also a milling technology that's out there. Hammer milling uh, is used for a sort of broad array of things. It's not just for food products. Um, How flour is milled, um, I don't know that anybody needs me to go through all of it, but it's basically cleaning, tempering, uh, more cleaning, crack stages, lots of sieving, uh, separation of streams, and then, um, you know, if we're making white flour into the bag, um, and we're gonna talk some about um, bolted flours or sifted flours, high extraction flours, we'll talk about that stuff a little bit, if people are interested. Wheat, the important stuff. Um, I think that I think this is another slide that's probably redundant in some ways for our audience here, but we can go through a little bit. Um, you know, the anatomy of the grain, endosperm, the germ. I always think of it like an egg a little bit. You've got the shell, which is the bran layer. You've got the white, which is the endosperm. And then you've got the genetic material uh, and a lot of nutrition held in the germ. Um, there's no GMO wheat that's allowed for commercial growing in the US. Um, and King Arthur has pushed back against those developments to a degree. Um, uh, and at the same time, 
Uh, lots of good work is being done with wheat breeding, and um, we endowed Steve Jones's chair at the Bread Lab at Washington State, uh, where they're doing a lot of work which relates to um, finding varietals which yield well, which are, are um, disease and pest resistant, and uh, last and certainly not least, they taste good, right? For so long, um, traditional breeding targets really related to yields and protein levels. And I think that now we're starting to look at it more like we look at tomatoes a little bit these days, you know? If you go to the farmer's market, except for Bernadette's because all they have is Chicago, Bear, Chicago Bears paraphernalia. Um, but if you go to a traditional farmer's market, um, you know, you can buy a Cherokee purple tomato, you can buy a uh, hundred different kinds of tomatoes and um, heirlooms are um, taking a better place in within our sort of food system um, because of flavor. And so new breeding targets are looking at flavor and color and other characteristics. Um, and I think that that will only continue um, if people begin or continue to eat more whole grains, because I think that if we take uh, uh, a good tomato and we pull everything out, uh, we just pull the juice out of it. To me, a lot of flavors in the skin, um, like grapes, there's flavor in the seeds too. And so I think that as we, as we eat or continue to eat a little bit more whole grain, I think the impact of um, single varietals and stuff like that um, will increase and improve. Um, so uh, let's see, new way of thinking. Yeah, we're breeding for flavor, breeding for nutrition, but we're also looking at um, protein and we're looking at yields and we're looking at disease resistance. Um, a great grain that tastes really good but doesn't yield enough to pay the farmer a reasonable wage for her work um, is not that valuable to our food system. Um, and I think that if you talk to Steve Jones and others, um, they're looking for the sweet spot. They're trying to find grain that produces um, yields which can support farmers and um, flavor and nutrition which, which can support eaters and um, bakers are in the middle. It's our job to um, let the wheat speak. Uh, we got a long way to go. For sure we got a long way to go. Um, I think that we as a country don't eat a lot of whole grain. Um, and I think that in general, our sort of flour IQ as a society isn't that great. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our system of how we organize flour and maybe we'll get to some of the reasons that it can be challenging. I mentioned the Bread Lab. A um, lot of interesting work coming out of there. If you haven't looked up Steve Jones, um, He's someone who I think is pushing the envelope. Um, and he certainly challenged me at points. I think we kind of know this, but I wanted to just so show something because I wasn't sure who would be on the call today really. But I just wanted to sort of show what the major US wheat growing regions are. And um, all the Vermont farmers about right now are throwing, you know, a used oil filter or something at me because <laughs> there are no dots in Vermont. Uh, there aren't that many dots in Texas, you know, the truth is, is that um, we're growing wheat all over the U.S. This is a map which sort of shows where concentrations are and historical concentrations remain. So you can kind of see uh, where the grain belt is. You can see where Durham's grown. You can see where soft wheats do well. Um, those are sort of traditional models. And I think one of the beautiful things of this sort of growing trend towards some regional food systems is that we're starting to see some expansion of this. That's cool. It doesn't mean that, you know, I think that the beauty of it is that we will, you know, as people get into regional food systems, they're still, so they might be able to buy some local whole wheat or they may be able to buy spelt or maybe down in Arkansas, someone's growing corn uh, or sorghum or whatever it is. Um, they're still blending with good, consistent, you know, all purpose and other flowers. It's how I tend to work with them. So I may be milling a portion of my miche using 
um, some Vermont grown wheat or something else um, that has some intentional value to it, but then I'm blending usually with some AP or something like that. So it's not an either or scenario. I guess that's what I wanted to express there is that I don't feel it has to be all or none, you know? And flour. Man, I went to Kansas last uh, fall to, um, to look at Farmer Direct and to talk to farmers basically. And uh, coming from Vermont and landing in Kansas where you can see like the fields are just insane. I don't know if everybody's been out there, uh, but uh, I guess in Chicago, you're pretty close to some land that's that flat. But man, coming from Vermont, I hadn't seen anything like that in a long time. So, um, flower categories in the U.S., um, you guys know what the gig is here. Um, we kind of had these big groups, um, all-purpose bread, high gluten, cake, pastry. Um, standards are pretty broad. You know, you can have a pretty wide range in the protein um, levels. King Arthur's been working on increasing people's what we call flower IQ. So what we're trying to do is use some metrics to begin to sneak some information into the consumer's diet around um, just protein percentages um, so that people begin to see the correlation. Um, and I don't know if we're making any progress. I think that we are. I mean, I think that there's people who are curious like, oh, what's that number on there? Um, I was in, uh, France earlier this year, just before COVID for um, Uropan to watch the Team USA compete. And I was in the grocery store and I was really kind of excited to see, you know, T45. Um, so in Europe, they have different ways, as you all know, um, to sort of rate flowers or to communicate what the flower is to the consumer. And you'll often see the T number. And uh, we're going to talk about extraction rate and ash quantity versus extraction rate. Um, I think that if I could sort of look into the crystal ball a little bit, I think that the next place that we might go with helping people to understand flour better, and I mean, I'm talking about retail, but also at the wholesale level, um, if you look at a bag of our like classic. Um, organic artisan, which is our like all purpose artisan flour. Every bag has a label on it. Every label has um, ash and it's not spec. It's the actual ash of the flour in that bag. It has protein. It has a mill date, it has all that information. And I think that what we're hoping to do is to um, continue to, I guess, educate the consumer, but also the baker around how ash affects flavor uh, and color. So the slide is basically saying um, in the U.S. we tend to group by protein categories. In Europe, it tends to relate more to ash. Uh, and, you know, more protein, stronger dough, more volume, more chew. Um, for us, you know, 10 and a half protein and higher for breads, 9% and lower for pastry and cakes. Um, I'm a big fan of all purpose and at the bakery at King Arthur, um, which was started by Jeffrey Hamelman in 2000, right around 2000. Um, we use a lot of AP, like our Galahad is kind of, you know, the gig. I don't know what the percentages would be, but I would say of the conventional flour that we use, it's by far um, the largest uh, of what we use. We use a little bit of, um, you know, some of the high gluten, um, but it's really only in a few artisan breads that have a lot of inclusions, like a lot of grains and stuff like that. So we're trying to um, get some strength back in or um, in some rye, flat, rye breads too. Jeffrey's a big fan of like these sort of European German style rye breads. And, you know, if it's a 66% rye or higher, he's going to use uh, a high gluten flour. Um, and I kind of like, I kind of waffle a little bit. I think that I can get a lot of what I want done with all purpose. And, you know, in the bakery, how many bags of flour do you want to move around or clean under um, on any given day? So 
I'm going to kind of go through these a little bit uh, because I think this is obvious information. All purpose 9 to 13, bread flour is kind of 12 to 14, high gluten. Cake. Um, you know, a couple years ago, we switched to unbleached cake flour. We don't have the bleached stuff anymore. Um, and I think that there's a little bit of a learning curve to making like the straight switch, but um, I like the color of it. Um, so uh, flour quality, I think we know, um, you know, when we're looking for flour quality, we're looking at physiochemical characteristics, protein content, ash, moisture, enzymatic activity, particle size, um, and we're, we're measuring it for uh, rheological properties like stability, um, elasticity, extensibility, absorption, and then we're also looking at the absence of, you know, anything chemicals like chemicals or heavy metals or mycotoxins like Dawn or some of the other mycotoxins. A great site, I'll give a quick plug here for Bakerpedia. I don't have anything to do with them, but I tell you what, that's a pretty darn good um, database of stuff. If you're looking for more information around some of these topics, I like it. Um, yeah, flour, specs, and COA. Spec is sort of like the goal. It's what you want the flour to hit. So it's what you tell the mill, you know, make me this, um, hit the spec. And then the COA, is the certificate of analysis, which is basically um, batch specific. So it's not what is the goal, it's what actually happened, you know? So it's like, uh, if I say my goal is to be a good communicator, and my wife says, you were not a good communicator yesterday. That's kind of like, she's my COA. Um, so um, there's a lot of information on the COA. Um, including but not limited to protein, ash, falling number. Those are kind of like the biggies. Um, ash is the mineral content in flour. Uh, it's an indication of residual bran. Um, ash is what remains if you take a sample of flour and you incinerate it. Um, ash is what remains. So it's mineral content. Um, ash is the European standard for classifying flour. Uh, it boosts fermentation activity and flavor. Um, yeah, more reading on extraction rate. You can read a lot about on extraction again on um, that a Bakerpedia uh, website. Yeah, Bakerpedia. Uh, really good. But some common um, rough extraction rates and ash content are in the, this is in this table. So Extraction rate is sort of like, what is the flour that you get if you mill a given grain to a given spec, right? What is the flour that you have in the bag? Type 110, type 85, type 65, you know, if you go to France, and um, when I was there in 2016, I was helping with the US Coupe team, and um, you know, we're making baguettes with type 65, T65 slightly higher than the U.S. all-purpose, slightly more yellow, slightly more flavorful. Um, I think that we're going to start seeing more and more of these flowers in the type 65, 70, 75, 80 range. For me, I, I'm, uh, I guess I'm showing all my cards, but I would probably be happy if, if like all-purpose flower were closer to like the type 70, type 80 for me personally, um, because a lot of the stuff that I make is made with few ingredients. So I like baguettes, you know, four ingredients. Flour needs to bring some flavor. I don't have, it's not like uh, if I'm making a chocolate, chocolate chip cookie, it doesn't really matter. But if I'm making a baguette or a sourdough that relies on few ingredients, then they had better be good. And I like a little bit of boosted ash um, content. Let's talk a little bit about testing. Um, and so falling number, um, I'm sure that people know this and I'm gonna kind of go through these quickly because I see that we're kind of coming up against time a little bit. Um, but basically falling number is a measure of enzymatic activity within the flower. And you know we have a target range around 250 to 300 seconds. Um, it's a 
little bit of a complicated um, test, but it basically measures the time it takes for a kind of like a glass pipette to fall through a slurry. And that rate is uh, determined by enzymatic activity. You don't, know how, how, you don't have to know how to do the test, um, but what you should know or can know is that good flour comes from the mill um, enzymatically balanced. So if it's a slow flour, if it doesn't have a good rate of fermentation based on the um, fungal am amylase uh, or um, how the flour was, the grain was when it came out of the field, it's adjusted at the mill so that it ferments well. Um, whole grain flours are not malted. It's kind of strange, right? They aren't malted. The reason for that is that in the grain, there's more amylase in the bran layer. And so if you're just having flour, which is white, it doesn't have much bran in it. And because there's not much bran in it, there isn't much amylase. And so um, white flour needs to be en enzymatically adjusted, whereas whole grain flours are not malted. Um, Farina graph. This measures the mixing tolerance of flour. And man, we could spend a whole day kind of going over these charts and talking about um, things like peak and stability. And, um, but basically this Farina graph is gonna tell you the baker, um, or more importantly, me the person who is, you know, working with the mill or working at the mill, um, how the flour performs. And so Farina graph and the Alveo graph, another method of testing. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, there's this little machine that mixes a, a little ball or puck of dough and then it's put over this other thing after it relaxes a little bit and it basically blows a bubble. And the machine uses some different metrics to measure um, what the elasticity and extensibility of the flower is. It's not super common in the US. You see it a lot more um, with European flowers, um, but we do take those metrics quarterly. So in addition to the farina graph, which is kind of like the bread and butter uh, US flower testing metrics, um, we also do use the alveo graph. Um, you don't see it quite as commonly, but um, you know, sometimes I get some questions from people and they're saying, what's the W value of Galahad? And I know that I'm talking to a European most of the time. Uh, I mentioned some of the additives, malted barley flour, um, enrichments. You do see, still see some enrichments in flour. Um, it's because of um, the fact that most of the flour we eat is made from the endosperm, which is less, has less mineral content. Um, you do still see some bromate out there. Um, we're not adding any bromate. You do still, still see some in the big manufacturers. Um, you're not allowed to use bromate around most of the world. Um, and then ascorbic. Um, you do see some ascorbic in um, clean label alternatives, uh, which are available um, off the shelf out there. Yeah, and I guess I mentioned we're not bleaching or bromating anything. Um, organic. We sell a lot of organic flour. Um, organic doesn't necessarily affect performance. Specs can be a little bit wider um, depending on where you're buying your flour. Um, organic flour, um, the mills have less of an opportunity to blend than they do with conventional flour just because there's less of it grown and so you can see a little bit more inconsistency at points. A um, little bit more money, but I've done the math, um, especially when I was running the bakery and, you know, looking at pennies on each loaf and stuff like that. And um, cost per loaf does go up, but um, it's not as high as what it looks like when you're buying a bag of the flour. Um, so it's an option that's out there. Good. Okay. So I tried to hurry through that. Um, and it's three o'clock and Bernadette, I'm, so we're a little bit longer, but I'm, I'm happy to stay here. I know that we're due to finish at three, but I'm happy to stay here and really, and talk and field some questions. Um, 
on this slide, and this is the last slide except for this one, and in case anybody wants to jump off, let me just say thank you. And if you have any questions, you want to follow up, please don't hesitate to reach out. It's just martin.philip, that's one L and no S, at kingarthurbaking.com. Happy to talk about just about anything. And then our bakery flower support team is just bakery flower support at kingarthurbaking.com. It's not King Arthur Flower anymore. Um, so this is maybe the best slide in the whole thing um, because it's where the conversation can happen. And I hope that I've not scared everybody off. Um, if anybody wants, we can just sort of open it up. Um, what I have here is just regional options, you know. There are more and more regional options for flour. Um, sifted or bolted flours are, I think, becoming more prominent. Um, single varieties, niche grains, in bakery milling, sprouted grains, gluten-free. Uh, we even sell keto flour now. So I guess I'll just open it up with that. I've got a quick question. Um, one of the local development people from our state had contacted me about a new grain and it, they called it Kernza. Have you ever Kernza. heard of that one? Yeah, yeah. That Jeff, you can jump in here too, but basically um, Kernza is a, um, it's like a grass seed, right? And what That's I've right. heard about it is that, and I was talking to, I don't know if anybody knows Dr. Andrew Ross, who's a cereal chemist. Uh, he's actually more of a starch chemist, but he does a lot of work with cereals. Um, and I keep asking Andrew about it because sometimes he's a source of like good and like what's what's next. Mm -hmm. And basically what he was saying is that it doesn't taste very good yet. Like they haven't quite figured out how to um, make it more delicious. Jeff, have you or has anybody else um, baked with it yet? No, I, I never baked with it. it. It gets a lot of popularity. The I think people these days tend to focus on something and then run with it. So it's a perennial. So the idea that you can plant it, it comes back every year. It has a really robust root system that's also what people talk about a lot but if you think about you know wheat is a cereal grass so kernza is a grass if you look at kernza seed it's grass seed is pretty small mm -hmm. so you're basically the proportion of bran to gut so to speak you know the it's a lot of bran so it's I mean, I think I don't want to call it a passion project. I think it's more than that, but I don't think it has the appeal to bakers as much as it does to the environmental side. Okay. Well, then, will you get some and um, and and uh, make something? Let us know how it is. Yeah, well, sure. I'll try and get some. For they were they were actually um, trying to convince us to try it at our bakery because um, two of the universities, North um, NDSU in North Dakota and the University of Minnesota, are working on things and they wanted bakeries to experiment with it to see if we could come up with anything that would work. And right now, of course, is not a good time for us to experiment because we're still short of help as we try and bake at 100% of our production needs with about 85% of our employees. So uh, when it quiets down, but uh, we haven't had a chance to try it yet. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, is anybody using sifted or bolted flowers? Not so much. Hey Martin, can Not I ask yet? a question? It's Mark. We, yeah, please jump in. Uh, I have a lot of bakeries that they get hold of us and they're thinking about milling their own flour. And is there a point where it's advantageous? You know, they're doing it because it's the in thing to do and they think they're going to be able to market it. But also, it, just your feeling, just in general, is it, you know, for the normal bakery, is there a cutoff point size wise that it's really a good idea to do that? Well, I think a couple things. Um, I think that I wouldn't do it unless I was making breads, quite a few breads with whole grains in them. Um, because basically, in the if you're milling in bakery, if you're doing it that way, um, the process for making sifted flour um, is challenging and yields are low. Um, but I think that if you're in a bakery where you've got 
a big line of sourdoughs and dark breads and um, you can <clears throat> mill flour for those, then I say absolutely go for it. Um, I think it can work. I mean, if we're talking about, um, is it financially vi viable? I think that's a different question. Um, I think that there's a pretty long tail uh, on the amount of time that it'll take to get you to where, you know, you're getting your sort of money back for that. But what I would argue for it, and I, I think this is like why I got the mill at King Arthur and why I would, why I think it's valuable is that, um, for me as a baker, I want to I want to have options to connect to um, the grain itself, and if I'm always taking it out of the bag, um, somehow there's a disconnect a little bit. And so having the mill, even if I wasn't milling everything that I was using or every bit of whole grain that we were using in breads, um, it was a way for me as a baker to connect. And so I think that that has a value which uh, a value which falls outside of the balance sheet sort of. Um, so in terms of size, um, I mean, I think it's hard to put a threshold on that. I think that it's also dependent upon your consumers. If you have a, a clientele um, and they really want to hear like the local stories and they want to hear about the ways which you're connected to your state or region and their food system, um, then you're going to get some, you know, you're going to get some of a bump out of that. But if you're the one who has to make a sale as it were, to your consumer about the value of it, that may be a bit of an uphill battle. And I have to say like, for us in where we are, I feel like we have a little bit of an uphill battle, whereas there are other com communities in the state of Vermont, which are much more sort of like, for lack of a better word, just a little crunchier, where people are coming in and they're like, hey, what about, you know, grain from, you know, local economies and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they had an easier time implementing, right. you know, fresh milling and and um, and getting the value out of it, if that makes sense. No, it does, thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. So we're, we're just a little over, but I appreciate you, Martin, staying on and, and really kind of chatting and allowing the group to ask questions. We had a few that had to drop off, but um, is there any other questions for Martin or for Jeff before we pop off? And um, I'd certainly uh, appreciate you staying on, Martin, so. I'm sure. Hi, this is Karen. I have a question about the cake flour, the unbleached cake flour, and its performance. And uh, if you've um, found any, what what adjustments need to be made to the formulas when you switch out from uh, switch out to the unbleached cake flour. Thanks. Yeah, I think that Jeff, would you say that what we find is that it doesn't quite have the strength of the bleached stuff. Yeah, for like classic high ratio cakes, it's just not, it just doesn't work. Like we kind of, we kind of got over that pretty quick. It, it was easier than, we just didn't have a solution. It's just not going to work for the high ratio cakes, like classic American style high ratio cakes. It does, uh, I think where it's been more adaptable is where people were getting a benefit from a bleached cake flour that maybe they didn't realize, like a biscuit, they were getting fluffier biscuits, they were getting more strength in their cookies, so less spread. So those things maybe were more just easy to adapt to with um, maybe taking some moisture out or blending in um, a little more higher protein flour. But for like a French or European style cakes, like sponge cakes, um, things that are more based on leavening with uh, air, or a whipping method, things like that. We seem to not have any issues with that. Okay, thank I mean, you. With it working, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, so the high ratio cake, it's just not gonna work. Other things, you may see some differences, but can be tweaked maybe, like I said, but but, but some of the cakes, it just hasn't really mattered. It's yep. more European style. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. And that's all we're using um, in the bakery for everything, for chiffon and everything else, so. Like you said, that European style, it seems to work well because you're relying on other leaveners. Very good. Thank you. I, I, if there's not any other questions, I know we had a couple, like I said, that had to hop off, but 
um, from all of us at the RBA to Jeff and to Martin, um, thank you so much for being on our town hall meeting this month. And um, all of this information is truly fascinating. And I know for bakers, sometimes they're just in the thick of things that they don't get a chance to really sort of learn what they're working with. And I always think these are very important so that bakers can do that. So um, we really, really appreciate it. And from all of us at the RBA, thank you so much for joining us today and have yeah, a good you. rest of your week. And um, hopefully we'll all see each other soon. <laughs> Yep. Thanks, y'all. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers.